It's a joy to be with you. Um, I, I wanted to share with you as we're getting ready to do baptisms. And she's not that unruly. She can stay. She's... Okay, all right, all right. You can come back if she improves. What's the old adage? Children are like New Year's resolution when they're crying. Best one carried out. But she wasn't crying, so I'm like, that's all right. Sometimes that's funny, and other times parents are like, gosh, he's cruel. <laughs> all right, um, so we're, we're going to be in the anchored reading series momentarily, but I wanted to kind of set it up for you. Um, I, I had uh, the privilege to go back to Tampa for the Save Our Children conference, and it was remarkable. And Dr. Mark McDonald was there, along with Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and uh, we had a, in the morning before we did the conference, we did a pastor's breakfast, and we, we were on a panel, and there's a ton of us, and then uh, Miles Lucas was facilitating the panel. He's a pastor, I think out of Indiana, near Notre Dame, and he's remarkable, and he's asking all the questions that were going down. I'm at the end of the line. I'd had a few cups of coffee, so I already had to like go to the bathroom, and have water, coffee. I'm like, whew, whew. you know, you're getting a sweat. You're like, come on, come on, come on, come on, and they're answering forever, and then I'm next to um, uh, Sam Sorbo, and she's the only woman on the panel, so she gets extra time, and it gets to her, and it's like, come on, hey, yeah. and she was, she didn't go long, it's just I had, yeah, so, um, and I'm noticing the pastor, or a pastor, standing next to uh, Miles, and he's, he's kind of like, looks like he wants to ask a question or something, and everyone answers their questions, it was great, but um, Dr. McDonald, I don't, I don't think he's a professing believer, and he uses uh, two words, um, you know, talking about people, um, and he was dealing with the transgender dysphoria, and he used two, two words that were reflective of uh, genitalia um, in, in describing people. Um, and it was, you know, I wouldn't have done it, but he did. And, and all of us were up there going, oh, man, you know, like, <laughs> good, good luck with that one. Uh, and none of us felt, none of us felt called to correct him because it 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 was a play on words that was fascinating to deal with what we're seeing uh, with the feminization of our, of our men. Uh, and and it, was, it, it was kind of, you know, as, as far as rhetoric is concerned, he did a good job in that regard. But he, he'd used two words in a room full of pastors he probably wouldn't use. But nobody in the room seemed offended. I didn't feel called to correct him. And then one other thing he, he commented on was... Um, how there's secular Jews in Hollywood that don't reflect, you know, the morality and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're dangerous. And Rabbi Khan didn't speak up about that. And so it concluded and that was the end of it. And I went to go use the restroom and I'm in there and I come out and there's controversy. And well, apparently the pastor that was standing there asked Miles if he could say hello and thank all the pastors for coming. And Miles said, sure. So he gave him the microphone. Well, he didn't do that. He immediately attacked Dr. McDonald for the two words and then came after Rabbi Jonathan Kahn because he's um, um, the man was professing to be a Messianic Jew. And, and it was just like, really? And it just, it just didn't go over well. And I'm listening to this, and I'm burdened for Mark because it's just a bad testimony. And I, I just thought, and we were in the gymnasium. It's not like, you know, it's just, it, was, it was a meeting. So I walk over to the man, and I just simply said, you know, it's to a man's benefit to overlook an offense. He goes, I, I can't let that go. You can't use those words in a church. I said, we're in a gymnasium. He goes, well, this is a church building. It's sanctified. And, you know, you can't answer a fool according to his folly. And I'm like, all right, man. You know, I, I, I just let it go. Well, I come to find out that he, he told Miles that he wanted to greet everybody, and he lied. And then we come to find out he's not even a pastor at the church. And the entire time he was standing there waiting for Rabbi Jonathan Kahn to say something wrong so he could correct him. And, and I thought to myself, the division in the body of Christ is tragic. And, and we're dividing over tertiary issues. And the church is under massive attack. And we're picking fly poop out of pepper. And if some of you are upset about the word poop that I just used, it's the same thing Mark did. And you're upset like the, I'm just equating you that way. <laughs> But it's, it's that idea that, that you know, and, and, and one of the things I adore about Miles Lucas is, is he, he's so tuned in to the culture of what's happening. And when I was back in Ohio at the, um, the 
uh, I forget the name of it, but it was a, it was a cool conference. Um, <laughs> True Church? No, I can't remember. Anyways, he said, uh, the, the pastor there, uh, Steve Whitlow, said, uh, and he did an, an incredible study on this. He said, we're, we're no longer non-denominational. He says, I don't even want to do that anymore. It was a rebellion against denominationalism, and then we said we we're non-denominational. And now, he said, where we're going, which is going to be the hope for the church, is post-denominationalism, where, look, I know that we don't agree on everything in the room, but there's basic tenets of the Christian faith that we don't negotiate. The deity of Christ, the inerrancy of scripture, right? the trinity, those are non-negotiables. The rest is tertiary. And you can hold that view, but don't come in and be contentious and divisive with it. You know, I've been pastoring this church for 23 years, and, and I've never changed the direction of where we we're going and what we've believed. I've, I've, I've been very clear on that. And if you come in and that's an issue you can't deal with, then this is not the fellowship for you. You gotta find one in where you're more aligned with that. And it's not like we want people to leave, but if you can't just sit and let the tertiary issues lie and have a conversation that's, that's civil, civil and kind and try to you know, talk to one another about that, that that's great. But, but to be divisive over non, uh, issues that are non-essential is we don't have that luxury, folks. Amen. We don't have that luxury. We are under attack and the enemy is unified to destroy us. And then, you know, as I was preparing the message, um, Jesus talked about loving your neighbor, and a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold, settings of silver. It's to a man's benefit to overlook an offense. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Um, and and I, I was with my, my son and my daughter-in-law. I uh, went to Phoenix this week, and I was there by myself, and then Michael and, and Elizabeth came. We had dinner, and the sun was just coming down. It was an early dinner. And our, 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 the place that we have, that we've had for a couple of years, is between two fairways, the first fairway and the 18th, and it's on a cul-de-sac. And so when you get uh, Wi-Fi, you have to put the name of your Wi-Fi, you know? Some, some people have weird names. Ours is Golf Ball Magnet. <laughs> because... On the 18th, everybody hits the house. I mean, we've had three broken windows, and, and we've gotten thicker windows, so now they don't break. But they're expensive, and I'm paying for it by collecting their golf balls when they land on my property. <laughs> and I've got buckets of golf balls. And we laugh about it, but, and they, they hit, and Michelle and I are like, oh, another one, oh, another one. And, and I'm sitting there with Michael and Elizabeth, and a golf ball hits the house. And Michael goes, what is that? And I go, is a golf ball hit the house? He goes, that, and he walks outside, and he goes, they, they, hit, they, they hit the plaster. I go, yeah. They hit the plaster. He goes, I'm going to talk to him. I go, Michael, don't. It, it, it's just not going to benefit. He goes, no, no, I got to dress. I go, Michael, no. You know, just be kind, gracious. You know, we're, we're in, the, there's, there's no legal recourse. I've studied it. It just, just let it go, son. <laughs> and he goes out and does whatever he does. And he was kind. And he comes in, he goes, okay. And, and Elizabeth's going, you know, Michael, you got to learn from your dad. And Michael's far wiser at 22 than I was, that I am probably at 60. And, and then we're in the backyard, and a golf ball hits the roof, bounces down, and I grab it, and it's a really nice golf ball. <laughs> and when I say this, a lot of you are like, can I have that? And a lot of you sent me texts after I said I, I got all these golf balls. You said, send me the Pro V, the Pro 5. <laughs> no, pay for them. <laughs> I have windows I have to repair. <laughs> well, this was one of them, and it was really a nice golf ball, and I knew the guy wanted it back. So I put it in my pocket, and I'm standing there. I go, Michael, let me show you how to do it. And the first golf cart pulls up, and it's a husband and wife, and I can tell it's not their golf ball because they're not looking for it, and they move on to where their ball is. And then the cart comes behind, and it's a, a guy, and he's with them. And he's like, man, you guys are in the danger zone. I go, yeah, when you're golfing. <laughs> I go, did you lose a ball? He goes, yeah. I go, is this it? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I'll give it back, but you have to do one thing for me. He goes, what? I go, tell me a Bible verse. He's like, uh, ooh, uh. And the, and the guy in the cart with his wife, who's their friend, goes, John 316. It's a pro V. He's like, John, John 316. What's it say? I don't know. I go, tell you what. A gentle answer turns away wrath. It's to a man's benefit to overlook an offense. That's out of the book of Proverbs. 
I said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you your ball back if you'll read Proverbs. He's like, all right. I go, here, but here's the extra. He goes, what's that? I go, I get to decide where the ball lies. He goes, great. And I go, <laughs> and it goes all the way towards the green. He goes, that's the best lie I've had all day. I go, read Proverbs. He goes, I will. And he drives off. I go, son, that's how you do it. So. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. <laughs> Clicker. So as I was preparing the message, I, I, I saw that Jesus spoke in our earlier reading as we're going through the anchored reading back in Luke 6. He said, talk about love your enemies. And we're going to cover that in a moment. But then in, in the, the week's readings, um, Jesus is dealing with one of his disciples. And this is what's fascinating to me. Christians are interesting creatures. Um, you know, we, I, I've always said we're a chimera. Uh, we're we're a, a cross between two creatures. We're, we're, we're sheep and we're wolves. And prior to coming to the Lord, we're wolves. We devour one another. And then sheep when we come to Christ. But then the wolf comes back periodically when we're not reading our Bibles and the cares of the world choke us out and our anger takes you know, residence and, and we get bitter and we strive. And the Bible says contention and strife and division and envy. And, and yes, and it just starts doing all this to you. So Jesus is addressing it and he comes in, into an issue with one of his disciples. These are the guys that are gonna turn the world right side up and it's Judas. And, and Judas is going to betray him and they're at the Last Supper. And how does Jesus deal with Judas? And it's fascinating because the passage is gonna minister to you, I truly believe. But if you have a Bible right now, please open up to Luke chapter six. And if you don't have a Bible, the folks will be walking down the aisle and they'll give you a Bible. And last week online, uh, I, I offered Bible to anyone who didn't have one who tunes in online and we, we got some requests and so we sent them out. And if you need a Bible, let us know. Uh, we'll send it out. If you don't have a Bible here, you can keep the one they're giving you. And Micah said he'd sign it for you. To your left, there you go. Oh, one more story. I went to go get Michelle an anniversary gift. I went to a boutique, and uh, I usually buy her stuff she returns. <laughs> no, no, she, she loves it. It's just, I always think, you know, I, I know what I'm doing, and I don't. And I, I'm learning, and I think this time I nailed it. I just, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Only took 34 years, but I think I nailed it. Um, but I went there and, and I'm talking with the, the store clerk and, and she says, what do you do? I, 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 sometimes I like it when people say that, sometimes I'm not sure you know, where they're going with it. I go, I'm a minister. She goes, I've never met a minister before. I go, really? She goes, no, I've never even been to a church. I go, what do you think? <laughs> and then we, you know, I just started talking to her about the Lord. And it was, it was really, it was just like fruit falling out of a tree. People are hungry, folks, right now. Yeah. Every chance you get. And, and the best way to evangelize is just asking questions about their own life. And so I just started asking her a question. I said, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? She said her age. I said, you, you, you have a degree? She said, yeah. And she told me your degree. And I said, so you're not doing that? She goes, no. And I said, what do you want to do in life? And she started sharing a bunch of stuff. And this is all a roadmap. And so I just started sharing with her based on the stuff that she, because everyone will tell you about their life and give you a roadmap to their heart. And, and it, it's just, it's one of those things the Lord showed me and you just start talking to them. And it was really just a, a, a precious time. And so I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to share your faith. Folks out there are desperate and they're waiting. They, think about it. The woman lived 28 years on this earth and she never met a minister in America. And, and you're all ministers, so get out there. Amen? amen? Amen means true. So if you said amen, you agree with me. Yeah. All right. All right. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. And if you would, please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. We're going to pick up at verse 27. 
Jesus is speaking. He just gave the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples. He is giving them the rules of the road for believers. This is a sermon for disciples, for Christians, not for the world. And this is what he says to Christians. He says, especially Christians who are dealing with non-Christians, okay? Because there's, there's two types of ways. He, dealing with non-Christians is going to be here. Dealing with Christians is going to be what Paul will describe. Here in Luke chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 27, but I say to you who hear, can, can all of you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, because that's what Jesus is pointing out. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you, to him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also, and from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Lord, thank you for your word, that we're to love our enemies and to do good to those who spitefully use us. Lord, I, I pray that through this study of your word, you would minister to each and every one of us that, Lord, through the understanding of how we're to operate as your children, that you would bring unity in the body of Christ and that they would know, the world would know that we are one. And so, Lord, please, I pray your blessing on all who are present in the hearing of my voice. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a seat if you would. So Jesus is describing what we're to do as Christians to a non-Christian world. We love our enemies. We do good to those who spitefully use us. We're patient and long-suffering. You have to choose to be offended. You know, and, and the anger of man doesn't accomplish the righteousness of God. And all of us fail at that. Yes? yes. Okay, so the eight are honest here. How about over here? <laughs> okay, good. No, I never fail, Pastor. You have, a, you have that issue, but you have a far bigger issue. No, there's, there's humility in the body of Christ. We recognize our failure. And the only thing we bring to the Lord is our sin, and then he gives us his righteousness in exchange. The only good thing in any of us is Jesus. The scripture says, in me, in Rob McCoy, dwells no good thing. I take credit for all the failure in my life. God gets credit for all the good. Anything good you see in my life is the Lord. And, and less of me and more of him. As the Apostle John said, I must decrease, but he must increase. That's what people are moved by, is more of Christ in your life. And so, this, this is, this, the only thing we can do is die to ourselves. The Apostle Paul said, I. And that word I means ego. Ego is self-preservation. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, it's Christ who lives in me. So the grave represents the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We die to ourselves, we live to Christ. So I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who lives, it's Christ who lives in me. And I've said this often, you can't insult a dead man. If you've ever been to an Irish wake or an open casket funeral, and you walk up to the deceased and you're like, you are ugly. No response. I've hated you my whole life. You're mean. You can poke him. Do you? Aren't you listening to me? No response because you're being controlled by someone who's no longer there. And the prison you created is all your own doing. You can't insult a dead man. They're teaching you a lesson. That, that, that the anger and the bitterness and the pain and the hurt is your unwillingness to give that to God. Forgiveness is putting the consequences of what that person's done into the hands of the Lord and moving on with your life. Not laying awake wanting revenge or a pound of flesh or restitution. Those images come in of what they've done and the Bible says hold that thought captive to the mind of Christ. Give it to the Lord and say, God, you take care of them. I'm moving on. But if you don't, you're not dead. You're not crucified. Your ego is wanting to make sure everyone knows 
that you're going to decide their fate. That's pride. Pride cometh before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. And so with this idea of loving your enemies, that's the last thing we want to do when we're wronged. Hello? Yeah. You, you strike my cheek, you're going to be picking up your teeth with your broken arm. No, 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 no. Give him the other one. <laughs> what? Is it? Mm-hmm. That's hard to do. We want justice when we're wronged. Yes? But Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I think we need mercy more than justice in our own lives. Do we want justice from God for what we've done? We would like mercy, amen? amen. Well, if you want mercy, you've got to give it. That's the economy of God. So the disciples walk with the Lord now from, from chapter 6. Now we get to chapter 22, which has been in our reading, and now Jesus is about to conclude his life on this earth as he gets to the last couple chapters of the book of Luke, the gospel according to Luke. He's getting ready to step off the earth. He's been pouring into the lives of these guys, and and now this is the final exam. And so he does it at a table at Passover. It's what we call the Last Supper. And all the guys gather around the table for the Last Supper, and And Jesus begins to minister to them. It's in Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill Jesus, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve, So he went his way and and conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray Jesus to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. And so he promised and sought opportunity to betray them in the absence of the multitude. Judas is the most trusted of the disciples to the point where they've given him the money to take care of because they trusted him. He's the one that seems the most put together and the last that they would ever think would betray the Lord. What brought Judas to a place of betrayal? Things didn't go the way he wanted. And so he's going to take matters into his own hands. That's a dangerous way to go. You want to fight with God, you're going to lose. The passage goes further with the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus sat down and the 12 apostles were with him. We drop down to verse 20. He already does the bread and now he's doing the cup. He says, likewise, as he's doing communion, likewise, Jesus also took the cup after the supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes, it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. As a matter of fact, in Matthew, they actually look at Jesus and they say, Lord, is it I? You know what that is? That's, that's introspection. You're, you're, Lord, see if there be any wicked way in me. They're, they're honestly asking, I mean, I'm capable of this. Is it me? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do this, Lord? And as they're going around the table with each of them asking the question that comes to a, another version of it in Matthew 26. When evening had come, he sat down with the 12. So as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. They were exceedingly sorrowful. Each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. It's kind of like each of them's going down and, and Judas is like, okay, I got to lay low. I got to do what they're doing. Uh, is, is it, Rabbi, is it I? Now, if the Lord was like me or like you, we'd respond like, is it me? Of course it is, Judas, you moron. <laughs> I'm God. I knew what you did. I know the 30 pieces of silver. I know who you talked to. 
No, he just, he says, he just simply answered him. He says, you've, had, you've said it. And even the way he said it, you've said it. It's not like he, he gave him up. The passage goes on in Luke. Disciples now argue about who's the greatest. Think about this. Uh, let's go back. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Please, somebody help me. Go again. Go again. Yeah, okay, stop. This, this is the final exam. He's showing them that you love your enemies. He's talking about someone who's betraying him. None of them know that it's Judas because Jesus treats his friends just like he does his enemies. Can that be said of us? And this, 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 is, this is the depiction. He's teaching them. He even, all the way back, this is the final exam of the teachings. Love your enemies. Do good to those who spitefully use you. Don't carry a grudge. Don't be divisive. Don't, don't cause strife and division. And this, is, this is to Christians. This is how you treat non-Christians. This is how you deal with Christians. And, and after this exam, and he's, he's talking about betrayal, they break bread and they're, they're having communion. The first communion that Christ is reflecting his own body as he's holding the bread and the cup of his own blood they're witnessing this. And, 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 and how do they answer the final exam? They start arguing. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which one should be considered the greatest. A massive failure. You just, you just failed the final exam. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves." I love this. The God of the universe who holds the heavens in the span of his hand is washing their feet and serving them dinner. Now, when you finish the service and you go out to lunch, any one of my family members or anyone who's ever spent any time with me, has ever gone to a restaurant with me, will know something. I am the best tipper on the face of the earth. I take time to ask the name of the waiter or the waitress and I want to find out something interesting about them. Because every time you're at a meal and you're being served, I want you to know that that person exceeds you in authority as far as God is concerned. They're teaching you something. They're underappreciated. The only time we ever ask them something is when something isn't going the way we want. We don't make eye contact with them, we're short. We think because we're paying for a meal we can abuse humanity. And then we feel justified by it. And yet the Lord is giving an example that this is an opportunity. I've been with people of, of renown who are very important and we sit down at a meal and they, they've been burning the candle at both ends, they're exhausted, they've been pouring their life out and they don't even make eye contact with, with the server. They're short with them, they, they describe exactly what they want and if they don't like it, they let them know. And I'll pause in the middle of that and I'll turn to that person and I'll say, you haven't made eye contact with that person creating the image of God that God declares in his own word is an example of him serving you. And I don't care how tired you are. The test of a servant is how you act when you're being treated like one. They haven't gotten angry with you. They haven't done anything to deserve what you, you, the way you've treated them. Imagine that's the Lord serving you. Make eye contact, make conversation. This is an opportunity to pour into their life and, and tell them, you know what's amazing about your job? Is that every time I see you serving, it reminds me of the Lord at the Last Supper, serving his disciples. You have a noble calling that you make people's lives easier and, and people overlook you. And the real test is how you carry a smile everywhere you go. And if they don't have a smile, stop and ask them why and encourage them and pour into their life. It's a great opportunity. But the disciples were more concerned with arguing at the table who was the greatest when the greatest was the one serving them. You think you, yourself to, to be the, the principal, 
and you're overlooking the, the one who exceeds you in authority. And, and the Lord wants that to be a humbling opportunity to instruct us as his children. Now that's for non-believers, but for believers, interestingly enough, for believers, there's a different, there's a different way to approach it. I'm sorry. I'll do a new passage next time. It's okay. For believers, there's a different way to approach it. Paul says to the church in Rome, he says, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offensive contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. They were arguing over tertiary issues of who's the greatest. And oftentimes we get our, our pet tertiary theological positions and we want people to know, you know where we stand. And, and, and we don't have the luxury in the body of Christ of that kind of division. And Paul says, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions, offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and, and avoid them. One of the things that I've, I've shared is for 23 years, nothing's changed here as to what our tenants are. We've stayed true to them every, every step of the way. And you come in this idea of post-denominationalism as you, you, you say, okay, I, we disagree on eschatology. But I love this fellowship, and I get it, and I can live understanding that you don't agree with it. And you can have fun conversations, but if it gets divisive and, and, and your ego is bruised, that's, that's not of the Lord. You understand? Because we agree on the basic tenets of the Christian faith. You know, I've often said the reason why there's Protestant ministers is because a position of Pope is already taken. We, 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 want, we, we, we want people to know. And, and we're so dogmatic about things we need not be. That, that it causes schisms and division. And typically, the more irritated we are with humanity over things that are not essential is because of the void in our own life. We, we like to pick a fight. We, we want to stroke our ego. But don't forget, especially at baptism, I have been crucified with Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. Paul says to the church at Corinth, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it, and even now, you're still not able. For you're still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? The disciples did it. These folks are doing it. Every church is gonna struggle with it, and he's giving the remedy for correction. In Philippians, he, he defines the correction on how to apply it so that the church can remain healthy. And he writes this to the church at Philippi, this idea of unity through humility. He says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And I'm going to conclude because we have baptisms to do. I'm going to conclude with a picture of this man. His name is Robert Chapman. He lived to be 99 years young. They called him R.C. Chapman. He had a quote, humility is the secret of fellowship, and pride is the secret of division. You go, well, who's R.C. Chapman? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Nobody knows him. In a sense, he's obscure. We have none of his commentaries, none of his writings. They, to do an attempt to do a, a biography on him is very difficult, considering the, the, the lack of historical writings he did of his own. But we do know his contemporaries and what they said of him. You all know Charles Spurgeon? Yeah? Charles Spurgeon said of R.C. Chapman, he said, he's the saintliest man I ever knew. Chapman became so well known that a letter from abroad addressed only to R.C. Chapman, University of Love, England, was correctly delivered to him. George Mueller of Bristol adored this man. He adored him. Also, a man named John Nelson Darby who vehemently disagreed 
with Robert Chapman over dispensationalism. And they went back and forth. And then there was an argument between George Mueller of Bristol, who had all the orphanages, and then there was Barnstaple and the churches that they pastored. And this division began to occur. It was the first time you ever saw non-denominationalism. And so they were calling each other out. In 1848, Robert Chapman sided with George Mueller in regards to a dispute over the ind- independency of each assembly and believed that John Nelson Darby should have waited much longer before excommunicating Mueller's assembly in Bristol for not supporting Darby in his dispute with Benjamin Wills Newton. This riled some supporters of Darby who were wanting to discredit Chapman, but Darby, however, reproved them, saying, you leave that man alone. We talk of the heavenlies, but Robert Chapman lives in them. He was the most humble servant. He never took a salary. He cared for the poor. When people would stay at his home, he'd serve them. He had the gift of hospitality equal to none. He was so tender in his way that he would speak with his adversaries that people just fell in love with him. He changed the the civic mindset of every community in which he dwelled. And yet... His name is written in heaven. We don't have a lot of his writings, but the men who have been remembered in history considered him to be the one who radically moved them to the things that they were accredited for doing. What's the point of it all? Can you go back to the picture of Pastor Chapman? The point of it all is this, for those of you being baptized and those who are gonna be witnessing the baptisms today. Remember, humility is the secret of fellowship and pride is the secret of division. This water is the grave, your ego dies. And when you come up, Christ lives. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word, and we thank you for the life of R.C. Chapman. We thank you, Lord, for the testimony of his humility, his patience, his long-suffering, his gentle answers, that most men would speak of him and say, I can never remember a day he was angry. Lord, he was tender, long-suffering, and patient, and the fruits of of your spirit richly dwelled in him. And may it be true for all of us this day as we are watching the church embattled and the enemy wants us to divide over things that we need not divide over. But Lord, may we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace by humility that we would be servants. We would be servants. And we would honor you and not divide over who is the greatest and whose point is the strongest. Lord, not at the expense of truth. Lord, great theologians have divided over things that are not the essentials, and we've never come up with a conclusive answer, though many believe themselves to be right. But God, what we do know is the deity of Christ, the Trinity, the inerrancy of Scripture, these tenets that we understand and hold to, the rest we can dwell together in civility and unity. And so, Lord, please... Holy Spirit, I pray your peace upon all who are present in the hearing of my voice that the body of Christ would be unified in this season of trial, that we would not think we have the luxury of division when the enemy is raging and devouring humanity. Help us, Lord, to be servants, because if we're to be great in the kingdom of God, we're to be servants of all. In Jesus' name, amen.